Welcome to Nifton Talks. It's Dr. Ashley Roby and with me is Dr. Colleen. Dr. Colleen, thanks for coming on. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about skincare products. And I have to say, as a plastic surgeon, I mean, skincare is great, but it's not what gets us going every day. You know, we're surgeons, we want to be in the OR, but as part of any kind of regimen where you want to look good, the skincare product line is super important. So we thought we would start with the beginning. And I would say, first of all, for those of our listeners or viewers that haven't had a formal consultation or talked to someone specifically about skincare products, just going to a department store or your local pharmacy can be super overwhelming. There are so many products. It's hard to know what's good and what's bad. And it's certainly not something that we can cover the full scope of on this podcast, but we wanted to break down some of the essentials, some of the things that you need, some of our recommendations, and then you can go from there. In general, from a pharmacy or from a department store, you're not getting prescription grade products. Sometimes that maybe doesn't matter, um, but sometimes I think it does. So we'll we'll kind of delve into that further when we talk about the various um, products that we recommend. But for any kind of skincare regimen, you need to start with clean skin. So you can't buy $500 and $200 and $300 products and slather them all over dirty, oily skin with flaking components. It just, it doesn't work. So you need to start off with clean skin. Usually that means having a good soap or cleanser, having an exfoliant, and then adding a toner as well. So having all three of those components, not necessarily all three of them all the time, but having the ability to do all three of those things uh, is important. And uh, that's how I start my skincare regimen. You know, some days I need more exfoliating than others. Uh, What about you, Dr. Colleen? Yes, my love of skincare was born out of my own skin problems. And I think that's true of a lot of people out there is that you, you learn a lot about it because you're trying to fix your own problems. So I had cystic acne. And I immersed myself in the world of skincare, um, not only because I'm interested in it as a plastic surgeon, but also because I wanted to fix my own face. And um, a lot of the things that I do, I've learned not only from, you know, learning about it from white papers, but also just trial and error and figuring out what works for my own skin. So I agree. I think a good cleanser is so, so important. I um, am not a fan for my skin type of cleansers that are too harsh and stripping. I like things that are more gentle. And I'm also a big fan at nighttime of the double cleanse. So the double cleanse has been hot for a decade or more. And you basically use something oil-based first to remove your makeup. So if you wear a lot of makeup, like I do, I I have not a lot on today, but normally I have a lot more on and I, I love eye makeup. You really need something that's going to get your eye makeup off without too much scrubbing or tugging on that delicate skin around your eye and oil-based things are my jam. So I love the balm. Micellar waters are decent. They're not great if you're wearing a lot of makeup, but I do that first. And then I follow up with a gentle cleanser and you certainly can do just an oil-based cleanser, but with my skin type, that is a recipe for breakouts. Yeah, I think that's a necessity, especially when you're talking about things like mascara and the eye makeups that you want to be gentle. You want to get those products off. Right. Uh, But yeah, you don't want to be exfoliating your eyelashes and your eyelids. There's, There's no reason for it. And I typically pick something a lot more gentle for my actual cleanser. I like to use my actives in serum form. I don't like my actives in my cleanser. Yeah. And, um, I, tend to go pretty generic on my um, skincare cleansing regimen. I don't think I need to buy a name brand. I've tried them. You know, for example, I used to use the Skin Medica toner, um, mm-hmm. which essentially I think their main ingredient was uh, witch hazel anyways. But they stopped selling it probably because people figured out, hey, I don't need to spend $50 on witch hazel. It's like $2 at Target. So... Uh, right. I mean, there's, there's just so many nicely priced clean. I, and I've said this on my, on my social media before, if you're gonna, if you're looking at your skincare budget and you're divvying up your money on different types of products, the cleanser requires the least percentage of your, you can buy a cleanser at the grocery store. That is a decent cleanser. That's not going to strip your skin. That won't destroy your skin. And if you only have a limited budget, that's the one area I would really recommend not going haywire. I love the double cleanse, especially if you are a lover of makeup like I am. And 
you don't like to scrub your face, you have sensitive skin. I think that the double cleanse is just the best and, and a nice gentle cleanser that doesn't strip afterwards is what I need to do to prevent breakouts. And it's just, my skin doesn't do well with very oil-based products. And so I just need that cleanse afterwards. And then for a toner, I just go with hypochlorous acid because again, I'm fair. Everything makes me red and inflamed. I'm acneic and the hypochlorous acid is like the key to my skin behaving well. Are you doing an exfoliant, like an, uh, an alpha hydroxy acid or even some of the more mechanical exfoliants? Yeah. So I change around a lot because I get sent a lot of PR, frankly, and I try things out and some things work, some things don't. My favorite exfoliants are, and I love cell acid products, the Zeo pads, those complexion renewal pads and the SkinCeuticals Blemish Plus Age are my absolute favorite for day. And then at night, I love glycolic. I'm a big glycolic person and I like the SkinCeuticals glycolic. So like if I'm not trying out other versions of products from other companies, that's kind of my go-to thing that I continuously go back to. Yeah, salicylic acid's nice, especially for acne prone skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works great. Yeah. And then in contrast to the benzyl peroxide, it doesn't bleach everything. I mean, I remember- Yeah, you know, benzyl peroxide works so well on my skin. (laughs) You know, I love it, but it just, it ruins everything. I mean, pillows, your towels. Yeah. And I want to be the person who can really well wash your hands and somehow prevent it, but I can't, I destroy everything with it. Um, if my kids get acne, I'm not buying them that either. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry. Or unless they just have all white sheets and towels and then. Yes. And then that, that's the easy solution. There you go. So uh, moving on, hydration usually is one of the next steps. And like you were saying, picking a cleanser, toner, exfoliant that's not overly aggressive and stripping out all of your natural moisturizing oils is probably of some benefit. And I think everyone has to meet that happy medium, right? Like not too oily, not too dry. It's different for everyone. But Especially where I am, I'm not in California where 65, it is literally like 10 <laughs> degrees here, super yeah. dry. And so moisturizing is an important part of not only just my face and neck, but my entire body <laughs> skincare regimen. You can get a lot of good moisturizing products that don't require breaking of the bank. The one thing that I do like to use that can be a little more pricey is adding some of the hyaluronic acids. I do use Skin Medica's HA5, um, although there's lots of HA, HA products available. But I think the nice thing about the hyaluronic acids is that it's not just an external moisturizer that's trying to block loss of moisture. You're actually getting increased moisture content of the skin at the skin levels. And I do like to incorporate that. It does add a little bit of cost to your regimen, but I think it's probably worth it. Yeah. And not all HA products are made the same. You know, there's a lot of inexpensive HA products out there. Um, you know, I know the Skin Medica um, and also the SkinCeuticals HA Intensifier have both been studied the actual product and they've done biopsies of the skin and showed like 30 plus ish more percentage of hyaluronic acid after, I think it's like 14 weeks or something like that. So Probably. not all hyaluronic products are gonna give you that effect. So I think if you're gonna spend money on one, I would do a good one. The inexpensive ones are nice, just light moisturizers, but they're, you can't really, you can't expect that they're gonna increase the HA content of your skin. They're not really improving your skin. They're just a in the moment light moisturizer. Yeah, I think that's true. And one big difference I can tell by having a quality HA product for my skincare regimen is that my need for moisturization, like the need for additional topical moisturizer, because, oh, my skin feels so dry, is definitely way less. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think when your skin is well balanced, you don't need moisturizer often. At least I don't, you know, and I think that you know, of course, there's some people that just have genetically dry skin, they're older, they're lacking ceramides and fatty acids and cholesterol in their skin. But a lot of people, if you work your products right, it's going to minimize your need for a heavy moisturizer. I don't use a lot of it. The only time I notice my skin is dry is that when I kind of move up and down with my retinols as far as the intensity. And sometimes I'm overdoing it and then I get the driest skin. But that's once your skin starts flaking off, there's no amount of moisturizer that's going to just make it look good again. It just has to be exfoliated off. Yeah, for sure. But most of over the counter type HA products are usually about less than 2%. It can be hard when you're trying to parse out what product has what type of ingredients. It's really hard to find out the information. I know that the Skin Medica, I don't even know their exact percentage. Their HA5, the five part is 
describing the five different types of hyaluronic acid. So it's not like it's a 5%, but you know, they're talking about how some of their, some of their HA is cross-linked, some of it's uncross-linked. Um, so, so for more immediate and more delayed hydration, that's their, that's their angle. Right. And I think, you know, I know medical skincare is not an actual like criteria. There's no like thing you have to meet to be medical skincare, but what you'll see in these more kind of doctor office based brands is they spend the money to do research on their actual product. Whereas in a lot of the things you'll see at the department store and um, at the pharmacy are going to be, you know, they'll tell you what a, what an ingredient does, but they didn't study it, their actual delivery system and their mix. And so I think that like if personally, when I spend money on products, I'm more comfortable spending money when I know that that exact product has been studied. I know exactly what to expect from that exact product, their delivery system, their mix. So I think that that to me is what makes medical skincare different. You know, I know that there's not like a, an actual definition of it, but a lot of the over the counter stuff, they haven't studied it. They're just pulling white papers on an ingredient and it's not actually their product. I think that's true. And that's why it's a gamble when you're just grabbing whatever yeah. high level at the grocery store. But the, like I said, I think if you're going to, because this is where we're starting to get into some of the more expensive products, um, the HAs, I think that's probably worth spending a little extra. The skincare cleansing regimen and the moisturization that you can probably get a lot of good products, really reasonable price at a lot of different locations. Yeah. Uh, Next, rejuvenating the skin. So there are a lot of products out there that promise all those types of benefits, like reduced wrinkles, more fullness, more plump skin. One of the more common, especially now, I feel like you hear a lot about it, are the, are the peptides. And people that are unfamiliar with peptides, peptides are just um, sequences of amino acids. So they're a chain of amino acids that is not long enough to meet the traditional like protein category. Um, so they're a little bit smaller than your average protein, and then they just fall into that peptide categorization. And depending on the peptide, you can get different kinds of results. The signal peptides help stimulate collagen and elastin, uh, of which we all need. It's estimated, I think, after your uh, let's say like when you're 45, like you've already lost a quarter of your collagen. Um, so we're somewhere in that age bracket and trying to do all the things that we can to either reverse or certainly slow that process. There are other peptides that like carrier peptides, things like the GHK CU. I feel like I see that a lot even over that's the an, like Yeah, the that's in a lot of things. Yeah. And that can help just deliver trace minerals to the skin, the kind of things that your skin needs to be healthy. I think you can find that in a lot of anti-aging and even scar type treatment products. Mm -hmm. There are some enzyme inhibitor peptides that can help degrade the breakdown of collagen and then also ones that help with melanin overproduction, so hyperpigmentation. And then you have some of the peptides that people describe as like neuropeptides. So like the Botox in the bottle and that's argireline. And it similar to Botox affects the way your body releases neurotransmitters. So this one actually reduces neurotransmitter release a little bit. And that's in contrast to Botox, which affects that the postsynaptic way those <laughs> neurotransmitters yeah. react with the nerves so that this product may help with reduced wrinkle formation if your muscles aren't firing as much. I haven't used much of that probably because I am just an ardent botulinum toxin user. So I don't know that. It don't um, work. I mean, you know, I mean, that that's the problem with any of these things. And, and it's just like these people that tape their faces. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the other stuff that there's the silicone patches too. All of these things, in order for the wrinkle to go away, the muscle has to have continuous no movement. And so when you're putting these things on sporadically and using them, you know, for a few hours, but not all the time, every time it's not working, the muscle's moving again and you lose the effect. So I personally just think those things are nonsense. I would never waste my money on those particular peptides and those products. The, the dumbest one is that frownies. It's like literally paper tape. It's craft it's craft paper and adhesive it doesn't and go like this they they tape themselves at night they like there's ones that go here and ones that go here 
and all of the photos I did, I did like a social media post. All the photos are so bad. They're like the after photo is like blown out. The light is really, really bright and you can't see anything. And then the before they're like doing this, you know, <laughs> like it's like, Give, show me what it looks like two hours after you take the patch off with normal lighting, you know, and adhesive is just not good for your skin. I mean, for, you and I put adhesive on people all the time, gentle adhesive with like Steri strips mm -hmm. and people's skin doesn't do well with it. So, I mean, we, it's a necessary evil for surgery, but just don't, don't stick paper tape all over your face. It's not going to work. It's a bad idea. Yeah. The other one, and I can't remember because I feel like there's lots of different names for it. And I'm sure it's been branded a lot of different ways. It's the one where you put on that clear gel and then yeah. the gel kind of dries and contracts and it looks like all your wrinkles have gone away. But you, Oh, you is that that Peter Thomas Roth one? That one went viral, the under eye. I mean, it looks fine if you're well, in, yeah, a, like in the video, they're like, look, they're like, look, my wrinkles went away. But then when they do this, it's like, it looks really funny in person. So like, you know, if, if maybe if you're on a photo shoot and it's a static, I mean, maybe that's a great option for some people. All you want to do is smile like this. Just, the, just like, right. don't, don't I mean, move a lot. Just. I wish it was true. I wish there was a magical product that erased all of my wrinkles, but it's just not reality. Yeah. If it sounds too good to be true, sometimes it just, it just is, you know, it just is. Yeah. I wish, like I said, it would be awesome if it was true. It's just not. I do use a lot of the TNS, the skin medicus TNS, which is just yeah. like a compilation of multiple peptides. A lot of the higher end products will contain, you know, 20, 30, hundreds of peptides in their mixture. And to go through every single one, it would probably be overwhelming, but peptides are just way of delivering targeted plans to your cells, right? Like telling the cells not to break down collagen, telling them to improve sure. their overall quality, those kinds of things. And so that leads us to exosomes. I know exosomes are more and more popular these days. We're hot these days. Yeah, everyone wants exosomes. You can get exosomes that are topical. You can get exosomes that are injected. And basically exosomes are essentially that this is always described as like the active ingredient inside stem cells. So you're not actually getting a cellular product. You're not getting something with genetic material that you're, you're able to trace and identify to a specific person, but you're getting all of the, the information for improved cellular health from that exosome. It's basically like a little extracellular blob off of that stem cell. And it contains, you know, various, growth factors and peptides as well that help improve tissue quality. And we use a lot of that in my practice. There are, are human derived and plant derived exosomes. So it kind of depends on which one you're using. But I think the idea behind all of them is something similar, improved skin quality, improved neovascularization, improved collagen, elastin, fibrin content, those kinds of things. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're great. There's a lot, I just got sent one that's platelet derived exosomes and I'm going to try that, that line. It's a more of a, a medical line meant for post-treatment and stuff, but it's, it's exciting times for skincare because it's getting more directed to kind of telling your cells what to do and not just repairing damage and adding things back. You're actually improving the way that your cells function. And I think that's going to be the future of all types of skincare and beauty treatments in general. Oh, for sure. So people will use it not only for aesthetic means, but also for functional repairs. Exosomes are being injected into joint spaces all over the body. So I agree. It is exciting. And I hope if I have any kind of major health issues, I can just in inject some targeted exosomes into those areas and be like, poof, it's fixed. Done. Someday. Oh, the whole brightening and pigment irregularity thing. When patients have brown spots, whether it's effects of sun exposure, or it can be things like melasma. There are a lot of treatments that can be utilized, but since we're focusing mo mostly on skincare regimens, uh, we won't go into detail about IPLs and lasers, but one that has been traditionally used for that is, is hydroquinone. And hydroquinone, some people describe it as a bleaching agent, and some people describe it as a color mixer. The idea behind that medication is that you are inhibiting new melanin formation. So melanin is the pigment that contributes to skin color. And if you have patches that are hyperpigmented, meaning too much melanin, 
that can present as dark spots. So you're using the hydroquinone to dampen the amount of melanin that's being produced. It's pretty effective. I think some people tolerate it better than other people. The downside of hydroquinone is that I think twofold. There's a super rare thing called onchronosis where you get just the the really dark kind of ochre, yellowy, brown color pigmentation. So you're essentially getting the the opposite of what you intended to get. Which right. Is, mm, I've never seen that. I use it all the time on patients. So it's, it's a very rare thing, but when it happens, it's horrible. And, and I think it's just people that are doing it, probably just using their hydroquinone incorrectly. So just using it for prolonged periods of time. So usually, and it varies per provider, but I think the average course of the hydroquinone is something around three months, some people a little bit less, some people a little bit more. And then it's recommended that you take a break. Yeah. I mean, it's not meant to be a a chronic uh, medication and a lot of people treat it that way just because it works, you know, and before we've had other options uh, available to patients, it was kind of the, the option if you're someone with a lot of pigmentation issue. And I think it's been very misused in the past. It also can apparently thin the skin, which I've also not seen that happen, but I'm very careful, cognizant of that when I treat my own patients with it. Yeah. I think it does supposedly thin the epidermis. And again, I think that's a side effect of prolonged and sustained. Just too long, yeah. The other theoretical concern is maybe increased risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing where, okay, part of the job of the melanin in your cells is to protect the nucleus. And if you're leaving your skin cells unprotected from things like UV light because you're preventing your nucleus from making that or your cells from making that melanin, maybe you're... Um, increasing your risk of nuclear damage, which could lead to cancer. I, I obviously I haven't seen that either, but and I think that most of that data is lab rodent derived. But yeah, then, not not people <laughs> from what I remember. But that being said, I think the general consensus is to do like three months and then take several months off and then resume again if needed. Yeah, for sure. It, it's kind of an oldie but goodie. It definitely works. I think with some of the newer things on the market, people are not using it as much. Because TXA in particular, it can be even more effective than hydroquinone in the right patient. And we can give it topically and orally. We can prescribe it as a pill. I just saw a paper where they were kind of looking at different formulations. And the, the oral is just a great option for patients with stubborn pigment. Obviously, you can't buy that over the counter as skin care. But, but TXA for it topically is, I mean, there's a million products with it. And it's not very expensive. Yeah, topical transamic acid is um, pretty good at that. And oftentimes I think it's in formulations, like it's usually not, oh, here's a bottle of TXA. It's right, right. There's like a, it has a mixture of things that are helpful with pigment. So, you know, kojic acid is really effective in some people, other people, it doesn't do anything, but it's often mixed with the TXA. And there's other things, a lot, a lot of these brightening products. Sprout, niacinamide. Yeah, oh, niacinamide can be great too. In the right, And often, you know, these things as standalones have not been really effective in the past, but now with these products that have mixes of all these things, they can be really effective. And people always think that brightening products are meant to lighten and bleach their skin, but they're not. Just think of them more as evening your skin tone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're they're meant to make your skin have an even color and not make you more fair or pale or or you know lighten your beautiful skin at your beautiful not kind of Michael Jackson your skin. Yeah, yeah, that's not that's not what these products are going to do. And I mean, I've had people with stubborn melasma who've tried hydroquinone and everything under the sun for years, and TXA is their jam. Like it's so simple, but it just works for them. So it, it's definitely worth trying these products if, if pigment's an issue for you and you've had trouble with other things in the past. I think the thing with TXA, is, if you're doing it orally, is that you have to be careful if someone has an increased risk of clots, like if they're on a bunch of birth control or they're a smoker. Yeah, you don't want to go to a med spa and get it. You want to make sure you're seeing a physician who knows what they're doing and is going to monitor you. But yeah, the topical, I guess that's not something that would cross my mind. It's just, you know, it's to be just very locally absorbed. No, Um, we get TXA to everybody in surgery. I mean, I'm sure you do too. They they get it IV in the operating room because it also helps with bleeding. Yeah, absolutely. Sunscreen. I think people are bored hearing about sunscreen, but it is super important. Um, I know. I, I was posting this weekend about this Kim Kardashian laying in her tanning bed stuff. I think that the, the single most important thing you can do to protect your skin is to avoid tanning and to wear sunscreen on a daily basis. And I love that Gen Z is much more cognizant than our generation. Like I went to an event two years ago, so it was a while ago, and it was bright, bright, bright sun. And 
all of the young people were like hiding under <laughs> the eaves and stuff at this, at this event we were at. And all of us olds were just standing out in the sun. And even people with darker skin were like making sure they had sunblock and were hiding in the shade. So I think the messaging luckily has been pretty strong for Gen Z and they're good about protecting their skin, whether they're a Fitzpatrick one or a Fitzpatrick five, you know, that's why it was so upsetting to see Kim Kardashian, who unfortunately, uh, millions of people laying in a, F and tanning bed. I'm like moron. And her sister has melanoma, had melanoma on her face. Really. It's just, it's just discouraging, but yeah, there hasn't been a lot of exciting things in, in SPF. There's been um, some really good SPF products with pigment in them for our darker skin friends that have not had good options, especially with physical blockers in the past. And then there also are a lot of these Korean sunblocks with different filters they don't allow in the United States. So the, the U.S. has um, the FDA regulates the ingredients in sunscreen as a medication, basically. And so the innovation in that space has been going nowhere for quite some time. And so in Europe and in Asia, they have different filters that are frankly superior to what we have in the United States. So it's been really hot. You're talking buy. about from mineral sunscreens. Yeah. So unfortunately we don't, we don't have access to that for, there's a, I think Coco we mostly mint. have like titanium and dioxide and uh, yeah, I mean, that's zinc oxide. That's really what, what we have. So there's, there's just better options um, out of Asia and you can buy them online. Uh, unfortunately you won't be able to buy them in stores usually here, but it's kind of, it's kind of sad. I mean, you know, we, we are great with innovating in so many areas, but this is such an important one that we've made it complicated. Well, the other challenge with that, too, is because, I mean, ideally, you know, I think a mineral or physical sunscreen is probably preferable to the chemical option. And some of the more popular chemical sunscreen ingredients, especially the oxybenzone and the octanoxate, are, are really probably not great for you. They can be endocrine disruptors and they affect the way your body communicates, sending incorrect messages. And so it can be really disruptive to your system. So on one hand... Yeah, you're trying to battle getting overexposure from UV rays, but then on the other hand, you're disrupting your entire endocrine system. I'm, I'm honestly fine with them. As a melanoma survivor, and I have read the research inside out and backwards, all of the endoc endocrine disruption stuff is with animals. It's never been shown in people. We don't put amounts of it on enough to, if you want to avoid it, I'm totally comfortable with patients just using physical blockers, but I, I just would rather people use sunscreen. It's one of the most common cancers. Melanoma is deadly. And like I said, there's no human evidence that it causes any trouble in people and all of the like reef safe stuff is nonsense the physical the physical blockers are just as bad for reefs as the chemical blockers there's there's a lot of information about that online um if you want to read up i just want people to wear sunblock i just you know i'm tired of seeing bad skin cancers in young people it's just awful yeah wearing sunscreen of some sort is good i wear a mineral sunscreen pretty much every morning the challenge with mineral sunscreen is that as far as application they're more cumbersome so yeah, they have a funny texture and they tend to not play well with makeup. Some of them are nice. There's a cheap one I was using, Good Molecules. It's like inexpensive. I was using that for a while. Right now I'm using, I was testing some Super Goop products. This one's a chemical one, but they have some, some mineral based ones that are nice as well. I mean, they're, they're all, they're all kind of tomato, tomato. It's rare that I find a, a um, US based skincare or sunblock that I'm like, yes, this is so different because they all use the same ingredients. And there's just it's it's hard to innovate in that space. I think I'm going to start trying out more of the Korean versions. Yeah, I haven't really looked into that. I like Alba just because I feel like as far as a chemical sunscreen, it doesn't seem to be too greasy and it's not. Yeah, it's it, it's a nice it's a nice one for sure. And I think uh, for the for the, the medical brands, Elta MD is probably one yeah. of the most beloved product lines for SPF in the United States. And it's just, it's good, consistent. The texture is nice. It plays well with other products. It's rare. You'll find someone that likes something more than that, than Elta. Elta is just, it's, it's kind of been the king of that space for a long time. Yeah. Um, oh, one I, I just found that's not bad is called Kula. And the only reason why I like it is- Love Kula. Love Kula, yeah. the guava scented one, the spray. Chef's well, because kit. it comes in like, and they have like little tiny bottles that are. Yeah, love Kula. Kula spray. They have different scents. That they don't. It doesn't smell sunblocky. It smells just yummy and tropical, but not gross. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I love that brand. That brand has great products. One more thing for the day we didn't talk about. What we antioxidants. Doing? So antioxidants are really, really important, a vitamin C product in skincare, and it's to protect your skin from free radical damage. 
My pet favorite is I love two products. I love SkinCeutical Silamarin, and I also love my favorite is Golden Hour from Educated Mess with a gold stabilized vitamin C. But I think everybody needs to be on an antioxidant. I'm like a big fan girl of that. Again, like we were talking about, a lot of these aging product lines usually contain like so. mm-hmm. and antioxidants and maybe exosomes. Sometimes I feel like the vitamin C tends to be packaged separately. It's probably a stabilization thing, but. It's a very difficult, it's, that, that's one of the problems. Like the gold stabilized and the golden hour is a more stable form, but you know, SkinCeuticals has a patent on the, on their formulation of CE Ferulic. And there's a lot of other brands that ha- in the pH that they use, and they're just, they're not as stable. So that's another area you don't want to spend big money on a non studied brand because you're probably not, especially if you're buying a CE Ferulic dupe, it's not going to be CE Ferulic because they have the patent on the formulation. Yeah, that's also true for the retinols. There's a stable yeah. issue for them as well. If you, someone's giving you a giant tub of a retinol, it's probably not great because those tend to not do well with lots of air exposure or light exposure. So that's why I feel like most of the nicer product lines come in a reduced air pump or yeah. you know, something where they're not being exposed to all the external with me- metal tubes, you know, things like that. Right. No, those are good too. There are a lot of different strengths of retinoids and you can get some of them over the counter and some of them are prescription strength. The ones that I feel like are most prominent in aesthetic skincare are the true retinols. There are some like retinol aldehydes and things like that, but I feel like definitely see more retinols. Uh, retinol are- is popular. You'll see. So it's, it's the, just for the listener. So with, with like retinoic acid, which is going to be your prescription version of this, the, you have retinal palmitate, you have retinol and then retinaldehyde. And that's like, your skin has to go through these steps to convert it to retinoic acid. So it's like the, the weaker version needs to be converted to the stronger version. So none of the over the counter ones in theory are as strong. There's some studies showing that some of the, you know, medical brands retinoids perform like the prescription ones and, and they don't have as many side effects. So for, especially if you're starting out in a retinoid, it might be a better land to start in. I like the retinal aldehydes. I think Naturium has a really nice one. If, you know, it has like pretty minimal side effects to dive into that world, but it's always best to take, to use the strongest one you can tolerate. Don't you think? Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, it depends on your definition of tolerate. I I find myself going between, yeah, I'm not doing like the quarter percent retinols because I feel like the results I'm just are too minimal. And my experience with most of the pharma pharmacy or department store grade retinols is that they don't seem like they do anything. Um, So I think the 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 ZO one, the ZO is the ZO Ret- their retinol product is the only retinol product that I have never been able to tolerate. Oh, really? It is like putting lava on your face. And I don't, I don't know what's wrong with that product, but I, it, it will never, I've tried three or four times and I cannot, I think they've changed names of the product it used to be called advanced radical night repair or something. And it is radical. It is, is it- not, not my, I friend. heard the same thing about their, um, they had a whole CEO had a whole line of, um, for hyperpigmentation and it included hydroquinone. I yeah, we, we have that and we prescribe it for patients and it's it it works, but it's intense. Yeah, it's it's, it takes a lot of hand holding because it is not easy to tolerate. It works. Yeah. But yeah, and you're not on it forever. I read flaky skin. Yeah. So um I think that I think their line had you're supposed to mix it with tretinoin, which is a stronger um they retinol. own they own Rafissa which is okay. the, the, it's the version of, of tretinoin that's uh, FDA cleared for anti, anti-aging, which is the same thing. It's just, you know, it's right like now. Ozempic and, you know, there are multiple names for it depending on the indication. And then there's the, the Adapalene, which is another. Mm-hmm. Um, Inexpensive, easy to find over the counter now. And um, I think the brand name for that is different. Different. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like the over the counter strength might be, it's probably less so than prescription strength, but um, then there's the, uh, the Tazerac, that's another retinoid. Tazerac's gnarly. Yeah. That, that one, I, I used that for a while when I had acne, that one is. Uh, that one's pretty, that that's can be pretty drying, but that's, that's pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> that one was rough on my skin. That one's pretty strong. Um, I've never tried the triferritine, but supposedly it's. Even I haven't tried that. 
Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of retinoids. And um, I think, you know, like you said, I think there's probably some truth to finding one, the strongest one that you can tolerate. But uh, yeah, it depends on your definition of tolerate. If you're meaning like you're getting through the day, but like your face is still peeling and red. Yeah, nobody wants that. Yeah. So I, I tend to do like a somewhere between, depending on the day, like a half and a 1% retinol. Yeah. That's probably about where I, 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 like I said, I try so many things right now. I'm using one. I, I use two in a row that aren't particularly strong. I use the Naturium 0.05 retinaldehyde, which I really like. That's a nice, the packaging's nice. It's just nice. And it's inexpensive. It's like $29. And then I, right now I'm trying the cocoa kind, uh, their retinol. And it's nice too. It's, it's also a more gentle one, but it's, it's another good entry level retinoid. I the biggest problem I have with retinoids in my patients is people, they, they give up too quickly and they don't, they don't try, they don't start to do it. Yeah. yeah. There's a really, there's really a, like good evidence with different things you can do to tolerate retinoids. And there are a lot of people just want to use it every night and have it work. And that's just not how retinoids work. Like you have to kind of wean into it and figure out what you need to do to help your skin tolerate it. And sometimes that means that you'll never be able to do it nightly. Sometimes that means that you'll have to put it on over your moisturizer because yeah. you need a little bit of something to, to break it up. And certain moisturizers like triple lipid have been shown to help people tolerate it too. So, um, you just you gotta try different things, but I, I think it's just such an important skincare ingredient. It thickens your skin. It, it helps reduce sebum production. It reduces fine lines and wrinkles. It's a great overall anti-aging, just skin health product. Yeah, it's definitely up there. And um, for people that are retinol or retinoid naive, starting with like a quarter percent strength retinol is reasonable. And then if you're starting off every third night and that's fine, then go to every other night and then every night. And if that's still fine, go up to half percent. And then you can just kind of slowly ramp up to the extent that it's tolerable. You don't have dry, red, peeling skin. <laughs> Right. And, the, and there's also, if you're just really naive to these medicines and they just terrorize you, there, there was a, a, a study where they looked at utilizing a chemical exfoliant first. It was a retexturizing activator from SkinCeuticals, which is a great moisturizing and chemical exfoliant in a bottle. And then finishing out a bottle of that and then starting. So you kind of teach your skin a little bit about the resurfacing before you start on the retinol and people tolerated the retinol better. So there's always a way we can get you to tolerate a retinol. Like if you're having trouble, talk to your plastic surgeon or dermatologist. Yeah, I think so. Retinol is definitely a go-to for skincare. Age-wise, I don't see a lot of 20-year-olds on retinols, but maybe late 20s and 30s for sure. Yeah, late 20s and 30s, I, I think most of my patients are, are already on it. I mean, skincare information is so easily accessible now online. I think that we're, we're going to see younger people starting all this stuff a lot earlier than we did. Oh, for sure. I mean, 20-year-olds 20, 20 are getting Botox. Right, you know? Yeah. So what are your thoughts about eye creams? Generally, eye creams are like a slightly different, sometimes weaker version of what you're applying to the face, maybe for more eye sensitivity. You're still not supposed to get them in your eye. I personally just smear whatever I put over my face all around my eyelids. But yeah, a lot of these product lines do make eye specific regimens. And I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm just not that into them. I have 400 different eye creams and it's, it, again, it's just cause I try a million skin products. If I wasn't being gifted all this stuff, I would probably not <laughs> use most of them. There's a few eye directed things that I do think are really nice. If you are puffy caffeine products that have caffeine in it are really nice for the morning and they don't tend to have face products that have caffeine in it. Like I like the AOXI from SkinCeuticals is a, is one that I enjoy just because I tend to get puffy in my under eye when I'm mm -hmm. a little sleep deprived. But other than that, yeah, I mean, you, you probably don't need them. I, I'm always trying different ones and they're all nice, but they're nice. I, I, they work, but I they work, but like they're, they're just expensive and they tend to be yeah. a lot more than the face products too. So if you have the skincare budget for it, they're lovely, but you probably could save some money there as well. Yeah. That's my take on them. We talked about some of the skincare lines, but Skin Medica, 
Skinceuticals, Jan Marini, Obagi, are they still making stuff? I get yeah, I'm actually, so Obagi, for people that don't know, Dr. Obagi is a now retired dermatologist uh, right down the street from me. And he sold his initial, he became famous for basically doing a, he was the first one that really did hydroquinone and a retinoid as like a skincare system that you could purchase. And he sold his skincare line and then immediately started a new skincare yeah. line. Obagi is not owned by Dr. Obagi. It's owned by someone else. And then his newer line is called Z-O because his first name is Zane or Zine, Z-E-I-N, Obagi. And Obagi is, is still around. They haven't had a lot of innovation, but they sent me their gel cream moisturizer. It's, it's really nice. I like it. I'm using it right now. Other than that, I don't use their line a whole lot, but it's, I mean, this is one of their newer products and it's quite nice. I used to use the Z-O stuff. I think it's good. Yeah. Zio is great. Some of their stuff, like I said, is just too, too harsh for my skin, but they have some really standout products. It's a really good line. There's nice. Elsa, Epiance, Elastin. I, and there's so many lines. It's hard to say that one is specifically superior to the other. And that's probably because they're not products in every line. Yeah. They all have their kind of little flagship products. I think that there are different takes, you know, as a plastic surgeon, would it be overwhelming if you had 10 product lines in your office? Yeah, it would be too much. I think. I uh, think it's hard for staff too. I think, you know, to, for your staff to be familiar with 10 full product lines is a lot to ask. That's like doing a PhD and in- and skincare. And that's not, not, I don't think that would be fair. So I think you, you want your staff to understand the skincare that they're utilizing. And I think it's not fair to expect them. Like I can't remember 10 lines. Why would I expect them to? So we, we have several lines, probably more than we need, but 10 would be a lot. There, there's good over the counter lines for listeners that don't have their budget, or they don't want to go into a doctor's office for some of these lines. I think the, the best inexpensive lines out there are going to be the ordinary and good molecules. It's ingredient driven, um, inexpensive products. I've loved everything I've tried from the Nutrium line, and I'm a total fangirl of Educated Mess. It's a newer skincare line that was co-founded by a cosmetic chemist that I'm friendly with, and the products are beautiful. So there's good stuff out there. You just have to, if if you're not going to go into some of these well-studied medical lines, you just want to make sure that you're spending your money in the right places. I would never spend big bucks for a department store line. I just don't think that I would. would Yeah, I don't think so. I just wouldn't. Monique, I don't even know about their stuff either. Yeah, La Mer, you know, I still have patients that are spent buying that $500 bottle of La Mer. It's like you can get TNS for less than that. I would never spend that much money on something that didn't have a uh, good research on the actual product. It may be incredible, but it hasn't really been studied. So I, I put my money where I see the white papers. I think the big spend items are, you know, get a quality, consider getting a quality hyaluronic acid product and get a co- product that has peptides, antioxidants, maybe exosomes, all those things. I use the TNS, but there there are alternatives to that as well. Zio has a great growth factor that I, I like probably as much as I like the T- TNS is great. I just go through it so fast. It, it makes me sad because it's so expensive. It's expensive. I know. Uh, I think the Elastin Trihex is supposed to be pretty good too. I like, we carry Elastin. I like Elastin products. I'll tell you what my beef with them is. And this is very superficial. Their packaging is cheap AF. And I feel like if I'm spending that much money for a product, I want it to feel luxe and expensive in my hand. And it feels like cheap crap I buy from Walmart, not like cheap plastic, like last in like, like the silver flakes off of the tops. I'm like, come on. I mean, I spent $200 for this. Like, (laughs) yeah, that's gross. That's embarrassing. Um, Yeah, that's a problem, but. As long as their product is good. Products are good. Yeah. I mean, they're nice, especially post-treatment. Like the post-treatment stuff is great. Skincare is fun. I mean, I I always tell people it's so overwhelming. And if you you haven't started a skincare regimen, you're new to it, that just start with one piece at a time. I think doing multiple steps in a skincare regimen is just going to turn a lot of people off to it. And so you want to start with the things that are important and then slowly move on from there. So there's nothing, there's no shame in just starting with a good cleanser, a good moisturizer and a sunblock, and then using that for a while until you feel comfortable in its habit. And then add in your antioxidant and your retinoid and, you know, adding, adding little by little is the best way to uh, figure out what, not only what your skin needs, what you tolerate, 
but also having it work into your lifestyle in a way that you can sustain long term. You know, I see these girls who go and they buy like a 10 step skincare regimen and they don't end up using everything because 10 steps takes a long time. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps and and most people don't need that many steps. And again, we, our time is valuable and you, you want to put your time into what is actually giving you that, that big impact. And you'll learn about your skin when you use skincare and you'll see what products don't do well. And it's hard to know what the problem is when you're using so many different things at once, especially when they're all new. That's my problem. Since I, I test so much skincare, there's always some breakout or problem. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell it is because I have four new things I started this week. Yeah, that sounds challenging. If you are new to a formal skincare regimen, that someone walking into a doctor's office and then having them tell you to buy eight products does sound for sure overwhelming. The truth is whether you are five or six or however many products long term, I don't spend tons of time on my skincare. It's one, you know, you're just cleaning and, and maybe exfoliating and putting, you know, you're just layer after layer and um, it doesn't feel that way. I don't feel like I have, you know, no, you just get used to it and it works into everything else. You put this one on why it's drying down, you put your deodorant on and then you learn how to do it in a way that doesn't slow you down. It doesn't rock your world. It's just it's, part of your, like a, it's like a three minute, two minute thing. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't take that long. As long as you get all the products, the right time to dry down and figure out how you do it. It's, it's not that hard. And I'm really loving, especially, I know people are mad about it on social media, but I love that these young preteens and stuff are getting into skincare. It's a lot of more- Sephora. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the problem with the Sephora stuff is kids are running amok and like smashing testers and things, but I think there's nothing wrong with an 11, 12 year old girl wanting a good cleanser, moisturizer and sunblock. I think that's awesome. Should they be on a retinol? No, but I mean, that's where you as a parent can educate them. I think it's great for them to take care of their skin and to learn to value that early on, you know, before they have the sun damage. For sure. Yeah. I don't have a problem with kids doing skincare products. And in fact, in that's, Around that age, the preteens and teens are when you really started getting into the acne problem. Yeah. And so having good skincare regimens before and during that time can really potentially make that whole teenage part of your life less stressful, right? No one wants to have a bunch of zits. And I know you were talking a little bit about Accutane and when is that prescribed and when is it yeah. not? There, there's like a weird anti-Accutane faction on TikTok. Every time I talk about it, I have like 10 of them pop up in my comments. But, you know, Accutane was one of the best decisions personally I've made in my life. And I know a lot of people will say the same thing. And it's certainly a medication without its complications. But there's a lot of people that think it does things it doesn't do. And one of the, the, the best advice I can give parents is have your kids see a dermatologist when they have significant acne and don't F around with seeing an esthetician with weird peels and facials and trying everything over the counter. You know, these scars that your child can suffer as a teenager are permanent and can have a lifelong psychological impact. And yeah. Then, if you have cystic acne. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like severe okay. acne. Yeah, it's probably worth it. The other thing that I think is actually pretty helpful, and I think you could consider before you're maybe wanting to do Accutane is the radiofrequency microneedling. I think that is is kind of a game changer in the arena of acne and skincare, and that you're really just treating right at the source of the problem. The challenge is, are you going to be able to convince a, you know, 13 year old boy that he wants RF microneedling? And I don't know about that. There is some discomfort to it, you know. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't like it. <laughs> so, someone's poking your face with needles and delivering a pulse of radio frequency energy. So. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's the opposite of fun. I think w- women, especially, we're used to pain as part of our beauty regimen with waxing and all the other stupid things we do, plucking eyebrows. I don't think young boys are, <laughs> are quite as used to it as girls, maybe. So yeah. I imagine it's more complicated with young men, but they are more educated about skincare because of social media. So maybe things will change there too. Sure. And maybe we'll figure out a way to make it so it's completely non-painful, but so far it, it hurts a little bit. It's worth it. Speaking of Accutane, Accutane in my geographic area is often used not for acne, but also just for pore size and skin texture. So patients mm-hmm. are on low dose Accutane and it's, it does really, it's really nice for that as well. So, you know, if you're seeing a dermatologist who's familiar with utilizing this medication for 
a variety of different things. It, it can be a really amazing medicine. It's just the one thing about it. And there's, you know, I won't go into the whole history of why this is the case, but it's a pain in the ass to be on because you have to have a test pregnancy uh, test every yeah. month and you have to do the eye pledge thing and log on and fill out questions. And it's not because it's any more dangerous than anything we prescribe. It's because there was a bunch of politics behind this med years ago. Um, you know, go, go to Wikipedia. You can read about how it all happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, the birth defects is what people are trying to avoid. Oh no, that's not why it's because of the whole suicide thing. I mean, you re it's an interesting story because there's lots of meds that we prescribe that have significant birth defects associated with them. It just goes to show you how when politics gets involved in medicine, weird stuff happens. Um, when politics gets involved in anything, weird stuff weird, a lot of weird stuff happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in general, like, I don't really want my state senator trying to tell me how to practice medicine because they don't yeah, know. I, I think most doctors feel that way about all of what we do. It's kind of, you know, or you don't, I would say it this way. You don't want someone with no education or background in your specialty trying to inform you how to practice your specialty. That is not how it should ever be. For sure. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Okay. Well, thanks, Dr. Colleen. Skincare, it's important. Maybe not be super glamorous, but it's definitely something that you have to do if you want to maintain healthy, good looking skin. And you can start off in your 20s with uh, just a good regimen of cleansing and maybe exfoliating, good sunscreen, moisturization. And then as you start creeping up into the late 20s and 30s, think about adding things like the hyaluronic acid and then the retinols and then things that are maybe even more as you can afford more. Yeah, <laughs> the peptides and the antioxidants and, and things of that nature. So all yeah. right, everybody. Bye. Adios.